Welcome to Vibrational Revelations. I'm Elena. I am Alejandro. And today we have our special, special guest, Dr. Bruce Lipton, who has been <laughs> fundamental in my life, I know, and many, many millions of people's lives on this planet of really merging the science and spirituality. And Dr. Bruce Lipton came from a background of stem cell biologist. And for those of you that are not familiar with his work, there's a couple of books that I love to recommend, The Biology of Belief and The Honeymoon Effect. So welcome, Dr. Bruce Lipton. How should we call you? Dr. Bruce Lipton or Bruce? Bruce. Bruce. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, first of all, Elena and uh, Alejandro, thank you for this opportunity. Because you know what my story is, as uh, I was fortunate enough to be in the right place to learn something that radically transformed my entire life on this planet to one of joy and happiness and honeymoon forever. Uh, but not only was that important, but it, then I realized it was important for me to help other people get there. Uh, and the reason is simply this. The more people that are in love that surround me, the more the buffer of love uh, is, you know, I, I never touch the outside crazy people anymore. I'm surrounded by a, a community of love. And this is the destination for our planet. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to be in the right place with my eyes and ears open enough to learn the lesson of life on this planet and then apply those lessons that was part two one was learning oh my god we are creating this whole thing and i was so excited when i understood the mechanism there's a mechanism so it's not just new agey and i was so excited when i saw the mechanism of how it worked and i i gathered people together i said i gotta tell you an understanding of how to create the most wonderful life on this planet and then they'd look at me and they go you know, Lipton, for a guy who says that, your, your life doesn't look that great. Ooh, I realized something. I was talking a talk, but surely I wasn't walking the talk. And that's when a wake-up call says, no, you have to actually live this, not think about it, but live it. And when I started to introduce in my life, it's the most wonderful transformation I could ever imagine to recognize we are creators, and if you understand the mechanism, then there's an option to create heaven on earth. That's what it's all about. In fact, spiritually, that's why I think we're here, <laughs> is to practice this creativity on this planet. And if you don't know what's going on and you don't know about the nature of programming, ooh, uh, <laughs> then our lives always look like we're victims of a world going on and things just happen. I go, no, we are creators. And that uh, is hard for people to imagine because if they look around and go, I created this, no, I, I would not, no, not me. And then they don't want to own creator, but we're going to talk about that. Yes, I love it. Thank you so much. I wanted to touch up on something. We actually just saw you about a month and a half ago in Florida, Jacksonville. So that was a, yes. our first time experience. It's such a beautiful experience to truly be in your presence because you do live what you teach and mm -hmm. it is so evident so no, thank you for that experience and no, i know <laughs> i am so honored because look as the, the truth as i said this is like a second version of life i had the first version for about 45 to so years and once i started to apply the knowledge that we'd like to talk about my life became a different life uh and i want to tell you it's the most wonderful experience i could ever imagine so uh, While well, people think I'm teaching all this, is no, I learned it from from cells by being a cellular biologist. And you say you learned this? I go yes. And the relevance about this, I'm relaying the teachings. I am not the creator of said teachings. <laughs> I downloaded this information, but it was so powerful that it has changed people's lives all over who have understood the nature of this message, just as my life changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm a recipient of this knowledge mm -hmm. and very, very happy because really the truth, and I'll, you know, we can get to it, the bottom line is we came here as creators to manifest heaven on earth. And uh, now for, uh, I, I've been with my partner Margaret, what, over 26 years now of a honeymoon, for 26 years, 
waking so up cool. every day going, oh my God, am I in love? Am I happy? It's a wonderful <laughs> way to live. Mm -hmm. That's so wonderful. So first I want to start with something that you talk about, and I'm going to paraphrase you, is that we're living through the sixth mass extinction on the planet currently. And it's interesting because I want to reference another point that you say that on earth we have Garden of Eden. And based on our vibrational revelations episodes that we've done, we've actually measured that our planet itself, the earth itself, vibrates as a sentient being at a very enlightened frequency, frequency of 700 on a scale of zero to a thousand. Humanity in the moment is at a frequency of 100, which is fear. So it was so relevant to what you shared in October. And I wanted to talk about that and start with this mass disconnect that is happening between our planet and who we are as species and what we're doing to ourselves. Okay, well, the first thing, as we just mentioned, was it's, this is the, actually the sixth mass extinction of life, which by definition means there were five previous mass extinctions of life. And I say, what does that represent? Well, the, we have some vision of evolution as starting in a very simple organism and then getting more and more complex over time as one continuous evolution. Science has recognized, no, evolution has not been one continuous event. It has starts and stops, where it starts and evolves and then crashes and then starts again and crashes. Five times life was thriving and some cataclysmic event essentially wiped out most of life. Uh, up to 90% of life has disappeared in some of the previous mass extinctions. I go, well, the last mass extinction is one that we're more familiar with. And I go, well, when's that? And I say, 66 million years ago, this planet was lush. I mean, it was a giant garden for sure. It was just beautiful. And there were animals called dinosaurs. I go, so what? I say, a comet hit near the Yucatan Peninsula. And that comet was so big that it upended the web of life. It just collapsed. And all of a sudden, the whole structure started to fall apart. We lost 75% uh, of life on this planet, including all the dinosaurs got lost. And then it started all over again. So for 66 million years, we've been going up on an evolution. And today we find we're on the actually crest and falling over the edge because we are creating, and I want to emphasize, we are creating our own mass extinction. I go, what do you mean? I say, all previous mass extinctions were natural events, earthquakes, comets, you know, things like that. Today's mass extinction has been recognized by science, and this is not new. This is, well, about, let's say, 15 years ago, science was already telling us we are entering or into what is called the sixth mass extinction. And the issue is, well, what's causing this one? And the answer is, uh-oh, human behavior has been destroying not just the humans, <laughs> but all of nature, the way we've, uh, you know, just pillaged the planet of its resources, polluted the planet, and destroying the, the elements that keep us alive, such as the rainforest in South America. To cut down the forest to make more hamburgers uh, is cutting our own throat. <laughs> because the, everything works on the planet in a harmony. It's a garden, okay, number one. Appropriately, a garden. I say, well, relevance of a garden. And the answer is, it's not a battleground. A garden is the height of cooperation of all organisms living in the garden. Every organism is supporting the, the wholeness of a garden until we get to humans. <laughs> and we're the one organism in the garden that is actually destroying the garden to the extent that we've now altered the web of life so much that it's collapsing. Uh, just a couple of facts so people can, there's something real going here. Uh, 50 years ago, the World Wildlife Foundation took a survey, how many animals are on the entire planet? And they just repeated it in 2016, same survey. 66% of all the animals that lived on the population in 1970 have disappeared. Only one third of the animal population is left. Two thirds disappeared. As they didn't disappear. We actually helped them destroy them by destroying the, the, the world environment in which they live. That humans are creating this. That in fact, uh, not only are we down to one third of the animals, but uh, scientists have recognized as a fact that by 2048, and that's not a long time from now, 
there will be no fish in the ocean on planet Earth. The reason? We polluted the water, we're overfishing all of the stock, and we are destroying the breeding grounds. Point, 2048, fish will be a, a history memory. that You'll have to show kids, this is what a fish looked like, because there won't be any in the ocean at that point. Uh, uh, other, there's just so many statistics all revealing what? A breakdown of the web of life, and yet all of it returns to human behavior. We are not honoring nature. We turn nature into a battleground, and that means destruction in a garden. So nature is giving us a shot. It's saying, you see, it's all falling around, it's falling apart, wherever you are, it's falling apart. Around the whole planet, there's chaos going everywhere, one at the same time, and everyone looks, oh, it's economic, it's social, it's racial, it's religious. I go, no, all of them are part of one, and that is mass extinction event. And that we're being called upon as humans to wake up. Do we want to be here? The planet's going to be here. Humans are going to disappear. <laughs> and you go, well, what happens if humans disappear? And the answer is very clear. Any place on this planet where humans have been excluded, such as Chernobyl, for example, after the uh, uh, reactor blew up, uh, when humans are excluded, nature returns to full force beauty and harmony. Uh, the the place Chernobyl used to be filled with buildings and stuff like that. It's their forest. It's a forest. There are trees growing out of buildings everywhere. It's got the highest wildlife population in all of the former Soviet Union is in Chernobyl. Why? No humans are allowed to be there. And the same thing applies to uh, like in New Zealand, they took a big part of the sea around New Zealand and said, no fishing will be allowed. No, no human intervention. Just keep away. That's only been about 10 years or so. Guess what? The, the sea life has come back completely with the humans being gone. So there's a simple message. We either learn to live in harmony or we don't have to be here according to nature. And nature is fact saying, maybe we shouldn't have humans because they are destroying the garden. And so this is a wake up call. And while we focus on all the little chaotic things going on all over the place, all of them collectively are an expression of our uh, inability to sustain ourselves the way we've been living on this planet. Yes, and right now we're, especially everything has intensified as far as the duality, the polarity of everything that is going on. How, how do you see that humanity can come together being on different pages within families, within systems, within friendships, within communities? Well, I think the most important thing is why we're here right now. And the answer is, what is the cause of the problem? And the answer is human behavior is not in harmony with the web of life. That human behavior is programmed into humans. We are programmed people, which we can talk about. And the, it, the, the seriousness is that we have been misprogrammed. And that's not an accident. It was actually intentional on a part of a large number of people that knew about the programming. And I say, well, what's the problem? I said, well, we're not programmed to be in harmony uh, with ourselves, with our community, with nature around us. We're in a world of a Darwinian competition for fitness, a struggle for life. Uh, and it's like, this is not a world of competition. A garden is a world of cooperation. Oh my God, we were off 180 degrees. We are completely going in the wrong direction. And in the process of destroying the garden, not recognizing we're destroying ourselves. And NASA, the big research institute in the United States, uh, has come to a very profound and important conclusion. It says that industrial civilization, the one we're in, mm -hmm. is facing, and this is a quote right out of the article, the title, is facing an irreversible collapse in the next couple of decades. Irreversible collapse is a very important word. <laughs> it means it's collapsing and it's not going back. <laughs> you can't reverse this. You, we have to change to then move the direction in another place. And if we don't change, nature is sort of already telling us, we don't need you. Humans, uh, you guys have been a pain in the ass in the garden. <laughs> Get out of the garden or learn as the indigenous people knew 10,000 years ago that the planet is a garden and that we're supposed to be gardeners in that garden. 
not not destroyers, pillagers of the garden. No, we're supposed to be gardeners. That was established by the indigenous people over 10,000 years ago. And somehow or other, we then got to the consciousness, oh no, we are the masters. <laughs> and I go, well, if you're gonna be a master, you better know how it works. And apparently we're not knowing how it works and our mastery is actually causing the destruction we're facing. So there's a simple conclusion. The answer is either we change our behavior and move into the future, or we sustain the way we are living and die out in the immediate future. That's a choice. Mm -hmm. And I choose the garden part. <laughs> we're there with you. <laughs> we're, yes. That's the whole idea. And the fact was, did I just learn this by accident? I say, no, there's a science behind the nature of harmony and community as a relevant aspect of an entire garden that humans, they're, they're like in, in a biblical sense, oh, God created the planet and nature and then added the humans like somebody added some option at the end. There's no oh, throw some <laughs> humans in there. And the fact is, no, that created a concept of separation, that humans were separate from the garden. And it was like, we were never separate from the garden. We are a product of the garden. If you kill the garden, then you kill ourselves. And that, yes, the mass extinction, while well, we lost the dinosaurs in the last one, is just as easily use, lose human civilization in this one. We are, in a sense, the dinosaurs terrorizing the earth at this moment. And uh, the earth would be very happy if we don't uh, stay here. But the other option is, but what if we learned, as the indigenous people did, that we take care of the environment, we take care of things, we're nurturers. That's a character of a mammal, nurturer, which means taking care. And I go, well, we failed at that job so much that nature is saying, well, dinosaurs didn't work. Apparently people don't work. Let's get rid of them too. And we're in process. Mm. How do you, going back to your example, when you said that you were teaching and then there was a mass awakening for you because you said that people were saying to you, turning the mirror on you and saying, well, you're not living it out yourself. How, yeah. how did that wake up within you? And how can other people awaken those cells and the intelligence that exists within to recognize the shift has to happen within. Well, I guess the, there, there were two aspects to this. One is the nature of misinformation that we've been programmed by. And I say, well, why is that a problem? I say, well, if your knowledge is incorrect, then trying to live in harmony with the planet isn't going to work because you're not in harmony with the planet. There's a change. There are some important changes. Uh, one I mentioned, Darwinian theory, which is a theory of survival of the fittest and the struggle for life, which is what? Competition. Kill the competition before they kill you. That, that's been a, a human story. You don't like the competition? War. <laughs> and I go, well, this is the problem is that we're all cells in the body of something bigger called humanity. We, we, we are individual units that collectively hum, human civilization is an organism, but it's an organism not living in harmony with the planet. And so it's an organism that is in threat at this moment. So Darwinian theory, life is not a competition. Life is cooperation, just the opposite, okay? Mm -hmm. That we also believe that we're in a world that's the, a universe divided into matter and energy. So we talk about the physical world and we talk about the invisible energy world as separate things. And it's like, that is an illusion because that's called Newtonian physics. Quantum physics, 1927 said, no, there are not two realms. There's one realm, it's all energy. And it's like, well, that's hard for the average human to take in. But the fact is quantum physics is the most valid science on this planet in regard to the theories have all been tested and verified that the idea is, yes, this is an energy universe and our consciousness as energy is the shaper of our reality. You wanna change reality, you don't go outside and change reality, you go inside, change consciousness, and reality reality changes on the outside, you know? So it's like, a, a you know, there's some book called, uh, you know, about awakening the inner healer. Oh, what's it called? Holistic, well, listen, wisdom. Yeah. A, a woman wrote this. Yes. 
and she's right. <laughs> the inner wisdom is the source of this outside. If this isn't working right, it's not because it doesn't work right. It's because our inner wisdom is faulty and manifesting a faulty version of our reality. And this is the whole wake up call. And, uh, you know, as I said, I learned that from the cells. So the Darwinian theme is no cells are not in war. Cells are in cooperation. Matter of fact, a human body is not a single entity. It's made out of 50 trillion cells. The cells are the living entity. The human definition, community of 50 trillion cells. And I say, why is it relevant? I say, when there's harmony in the community, that's called health. When there's disharmony in the community, that's called disease. And all of a sudden it says, well, we're manifesting an understanding, a politic. Our consciousness is a government for 50 trillion cells. And if our consciousness is not in harmony with the world, then our cells are not in harmony with the world, then we're in a lot of trouble. And then now we find out that not only is our consciousness affecting what's going on in the inside, our consciousness is creating what's going on on the outside. It's like, oh my God, we're manifesting this. I go, look, 1927, okay, quantum physics was, was founded. And um, one of the fathers of quantum physics, the most important phrase in the finding of that 1927, quote, the mind is the matrix of all matter. Now, the movie The Matrix actually came from that phrase. I said, but what does it mean? The mind is the matrix of all matter. The mind is the creator of all matter. The mind is putting the energy into a shape that we manifest. And I go, wow, that was 1927. I go, recently, the journal Nature, one of the most prestigious scientific journals on this planet, an article from a quantum physicist at Johns Hopkins University, the article is entitled The Mental Universe. It's an article about physics. I go, it might be complicated, so I will actually tell you the exact last sentence in the entire article, and I just want you to remember, this is published in the most prestigious scientific journal. And here's the final sentence. And final sentence. The universe is immaterial. Immaterial means not matter. It's energy. That's what it was since 1927. The universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual. Live and enjoy. Oh my God. A scientific journal has just re, you know, revealed what we've been knowing since 1927, but re-emphasizing it again. We, through our mental and spiritual activities, are creating the world from an immaterial energy. And all of a sudden I say, well then, guess what? There's responsibility. If we're creating it, then we're responsible for the creation. And then, of course, if you look at the world right now, nobody wants to own responsibility for the collapse. It's not me. It's them. Everybody else. I didn't do it. And I go, unfortunately, we're all involved in this creation. But are we creating this with our conscious creative wishes and desires? And I say, no. The world we're creating has been programmed into us. The beliefs and attitudes, behaviors that we live by are programs. And we learn these programs. I go, programs? I, why? I go, first of all, let's recognize a fact. The brain is the most powerful computer humans have ever experienced. But the fact that it's a computer makes it interesting because it says a brain, an organic computer, has the same functions as the silicon-based computer that we're using, laptops and all that. I go, what are the same functions? So I say, in the old days, we would buy a computer. They didn't put the programs in. When you bought a computer, it came as a computer. You could push start, it boots up, the screen lights up, and then I say, do something, write, draw, spreadsheet. And you say, no, I can't do anything. I say, you just got a brand new computer. What do you mean you can't use it? Look, it's just booted up, let's go. You go, no, not until I put programs in a computer can I use the computer. And I go, this is exactly the same parallel in human biology. The brain as a computer boots up, screen on, in the last trimester of pregnancy. Then I say, use it. And I say, can't use it. Why not? I don't have any programs. Ah! It turns out 
the last trimester of pregnancy through age seven is a period of programming of the human computer. And I said, what do you mean? I say, the brain of a child under seven is not in a state of consciousness. It's in a lower vibration, a lower energy called theta. Theta is characterized by imagination. You know, uh, the tea party, the famous tea party, pour nothing into the cup, drink nothing, and then exclaim that was the best tea you ever had in your life. I go, that's theta, imagination, or riding that broom and calling it a horse. To the kid on the broom, it is not a broom. It is a horse, imagination, okay? So I say, yep, yeah, the child's brain in the first seven years is predominantly in theta. And I go, well, what's theta? Imagination. Yeah, I say, what else? And this is it. You ready? Hypnosis. I go, what do you mean hypnosis? I go, the brain of the child boots up last trimester of pregnancy, but it has to learn to deal with the world. It has to know the rules of how to be a member of a family. What are the rules to be a member of a community? How should we behave to, you know, be part of the structure? Well, those are not genetic. That's learned. <laughs> I go, well, how does a child learn this? They're an infant. They're, how they, thousands of rules, you know? How, how I talk to my own child is different than how I talk to the neighbor's child, which is different than how I talk to my partner, Margaret, than how I talk to the neighbor's wife, which is different than how I even talk to the policeman. And all of a sudden I say, oh my God, you got to know a lot of different ways of communicating. I go, you have to learn these. I go, an infant it doesn't have that capacity to learn. And in fact, its brain until age seven is not even in a conscious level. It's in subconscious uh, programming theta. And I go, so relevance? How do I get a program? And the answer is theta. I said, what does that mean? Hypnosis. How do I get a program to be a member of a family? I observe my mother, I observe my father, I observe my siblings. See, they're all their behaviors. And my brain is like a video recorder. Whatever it saw, boom, it downloaded the behavior. Watch the community, see how they behave. Oh, I got to behave like that. Boom, download. So the programs that are put into our computer to get us an opportunity to use it are put in in the first seven years of life by nothing more than observing the world and downloading it into the subconscious. Uh, uh, and this is the process of theta. Now there's one problem, ready? Conscious mind isn't working. I go, so what? I go, there's nobody filtering the programs. You can download good programs and you can download self sabotaging programs, but there won't be anybody checking, hey, good program, bad program. No, all programs. <clears throat> so I say, well, where's the problem? I say, it's now recognized up to 60% of the programs we downloaded are actually disempowering, self sabotaging, and limiting beliefs. I go, but we didn't, we didn't filter them out. They're in the subconscious. Then the rational mind goes, well, yeah, but after age seven, we are operating from the conscious creative mind. Subconscious is habit, programs, just what we downloaded, programs. Conscious mind's creative. So I say, oh, after age seven, I'm creative. I go, yes, you are. One problem. And I go, and it's a big problem. I say, what is that? The conscious mind when looking out at the world, can be the creator to manifest what we see in the world. But the conscious mind, when it is thinking, is not looking out at the world. The conscious mind, when it's thinking, is not looking out, it's looking in. Why? Thoughts are inside the head. So, uh, for example, Elena, today's Tuesday. I said, what are you doing on Friday? Now, if you don't have it written in front of you right at this moment, I bet you in a moment, you could think oh, on Friday, I'm going, oh, I'm going to do this. I go, well, wait a minute. Where'd you get that answer? In my head. I said, then when you were getting the answer, you weren't looking out, you were looking in. I go, yes. Thinking redirects consciousness from paying attention to what's going on in the outer world to paying attention to what the inner world is doing. What am I doing now? Where am I going next? What will happen if I do this? Who's going to do that? Well, I'm thinking, thinking, thinking. 90 percent of the day. And I go, so why is that relevant? I say, well, if the conscious mind's not looking out at the world 95% of the day, then what am I doing 95% of the day? And I go, the subconscious habits that you downloaded by observing family and community are programs. I say, they run automatically. 
So when the conscious mind is thinking, it goes inside, but the subconscious mind becomes autopilot. It knows how to drive the car, knows how to walk, it knows how to do the job. Anything you've learned from a habit, it knows how to do. It doesn't need you to do those things. You don't have to think about how to walk. It's so automatic that you don't even have to say, I'm walking, I'm moving. You say, oh, I want that over there, and there you are, over there. The system program took you there without you even paying attention. So subconscious is very powerful. As a processor, the subconscious is a million times more powerful an information processor than is the conscious mind, which is located behind your forehead. I go, so relevance. The brain is a computer. It boots up in the last trimester of pregnancy, but it cannot operate until programs are put in. How does it get programs? The brain is operating like a video recorder. Whatever it observes, it downloads. And I go, oh, so the behavior of mother's in there, behavior of father? Yeah, because generally, as I say in my particular case, I observe my father because that's my role model. I'm going to be the boy, man, whatever, and do his role. I observe my mother, and I see her, and I say, well, that's what a partner looks like. And so I already now got, that's what I'm looking for, one of those, okay? Uh, and the idea is I've learned that by observing all this. So now when I grow up, my behavior, let's say in my relationship behavior, where did I get that from? My father, by observing him. Mm -hmm. you know, good idea, bad idea. Good idea because I didn't have to study a book to learn it. Bad idea because my father's life and his relationship with my mother was quite dysfunctional. I say, so what? And I say, I downloaded his behavior and I put that into my subconscious mind. I go, so why is it relevant? Well, for 40 plus years, when I got into a relationship activity, 95% of my life was coming from the program. 95% of my behavior was my father's behavior. Look, it was crap when he was with my mother. And if I'm trying to find a relationship and I'm playing his behavior, I'm not finding one. Nope. 45 plus years, never any kind of success in finding a great relationship. Why? Because my subconscious behavior running 95% of the day was playing my father's behavior, which was self-destructive. What do I have to do? I have to change these programs. And I go, oh, well, there's a problem. I say, what do you mean? I say, what are my programs? What do you mean, what are my programs? I say, well, you were being programmed in the last trimester of pregnancy your brain was not conscious. It had no idea what the hell the program was. It wasn't even working. I go, and you were programmed through age seven. I go, yeah, but your brain was operating in theta. It wasn't operating in the higher level of consciousness. So again, you're not necessarily familiar with the program. I say, yeah, you were programmed even before you were born. Do you know what that is? No. You were programmed a whole year from zero to one. Do you remember the programs? No, you weren't there. Oh, wait, you were, whole, you were programmed a whole year, one to two. <laughs> You remember the program? No, nope, wasn't there. And I'm beginning to see the fact is my fundamental programs I am not aware of because they were installed when my consciousness wasn't observing. So that's why I said good program, bad program. They all got downloaded because there was no filter. And I go, now I want to help our audience. I'm going to help you very much identify what the programs are because it's simple. Simple? Yes. Here's the point. 95, excuse me, 95% of your life is coming from the subconscious. Your life is a printout of your programs. I go, why is that relevant? I said, just wherever you are right now, stop and consider this. The things you like and want that come into your life, they came in because you have a program to acknowledge and support them. But the things that you wish for and desire and you really want, but are not coming in, you have to work hard. You have to sweat over it. You have to make a lot of effort. I'm, I'm, I'm sweat. I'm gonna make it happen. I'm working real hard. I go, why are you working so hard? And the answer is this: whatever that destination you were seeking, it is not supported by your program. So all of a sudden, I say, oh, what are my programs? I say, wherever my struggles are, that's my program. And that gives you an opportunity to say, I don't like that program. I want to change that program. You can change the program. By God, yes, because if you couldn't, this is a crappy show. <laughs> and change the program. Exactly. But, but the issue about changing the program is simply this. 
the fact is simple. We always talk about the mind in quantum physics. The mind is creating a reality. Now, the mind, the mind, sounds like there's one mind. And I go, that's where the whole problem starts. There are two minds. They don't have the same function, and they don't learn in the same way. That's where a problem comes from. I say they have different functions. The conscious mind, the latest evolution of the brain, right behind your forehead, it is a mind that is based on creativity. Uh, you know, I ask you, what do you want from your life? And you give me a creative answer. I want this. I want to live in paradise. And go, That's nice creativity. I say, that is a character of the conscious mind. Imagination, creativity. What about the subconscious mind? I go, oh, no, its character is habit. It learns habits. I go, why? Because without it, <laughs> we'd have a tough time. <laughs> Excuse me, a tough time. Imagine this. If you didn't have a habit, you spend your first day today learning how to walk. And you learned how to walk, and then you went to bed, you woke up, guess what? Oh, I got to relearn how to walk again. Every day you'd be learning how to walk. I say, but if you have a habit, you can learn how to walk, put it into the habit mind, wake up every day, and it's automatically there. So the habit mind's a good thing, you know? You don't have to relearn how to drive the car every time you sit behind the steering wheel. You know, you don't have to relearn everything that are important to you because if you learn them, they have become habits. Walking, talking, driving, playing an instrument, all these things. I go, why is that relevant? I said, because it's a beautiful machine, the habit machine. Unfortunately, what if it's programmed with stuff that's not in harmony with your life? I go, now the machine's not working for you. It's working against you because you'll automatically play programs that are going to sabotage you. So I go, a lot of people say, the subconscious mind, that's the evil mind. I go, the subconscious mind's a hard drive, like in a computer. I go, why is it relevant? I said, is your computer hard drive evil or good? I go, what do you mean? It's a hard drive. I go, precisely. The subconscious mind isn't evil or, or good. It's the programs in the subconscious mind that can be evil or good. Good one, walking, okay? Evil one, watch my father's behavior with my mother. Ooh, ooh bad program. <laughs> and I go, so why is all this relevant? Because I want you to recognize the fact that it's so hard for people in this world that have become so used to seeing themselves as victims this happened to me, and those people did this to me, and that happened, and I, oh, I'm just a victim of the world. I go, wow, guess what? Completely opposite. You are the creator. Well, that irritates a lot of people. What do you mean? I say, you're the creator of your life, and they go back, and I created my cancer? Yes, you did. <gasps> okay, I created the divorce situation? Yes, you did. <laughs> I go, what, you know, people don't want to own that because if they look back, they get, no, don't, don't, I don't want to blame myself. That happened to me. I'm the victim. I go, no, you're the creator, but nobody wants to own it. Then I have to give the fact that's a truth that's fundamental. And I say, what? There are words that we use that are called shame, blame, guilty, victim. These are very negative traits and characters. And, and so when people look at their lives and I say, uh, well, you created the cancer. And they go, no, don't blame me. Don't, I'm not, I wouldn't do that. And so here's the answer. If you don't know you're the creator and you've never been programmed to be the creator, then you have no knowledge of what's going on. You were just programmed by your parents and your community of how to live. And if they were not living in harmony with the world, neither are you living in harmony with the world because you downloaded their programs. I said, but what about that cancer? I said, you didn't know you were a creator. I said, why is that important? Because then you're not responsible. If I didn't know I was the creator and I caused all these things, I can't blame you, say you're guilty, because you didn't know there was another way. So you just, how can, how can I blame myself? Uh, cancer, genes did that. I go, no, they didn't. But the point about it is this. There's no responsibility because we've never been programmed that we are creators. The powerful people in this world don't want you to be programming your life because if you are a victim, they control you.
And we're all victims here in this world. So here's my point, very, very important point. Whatever happened up till this moment in your history, you cannot be blamed for it. You can't be guilty. I say you can only, listen, the only time you can use those words legitimately is if you knew there was a right way to do something and you chose not to do it, you're guilty. You're, you, I can blame you for that. But if you didn't know and you do something, how can I blame you? You were ignorant of this. I had no idea I was doing this. I go, no, therefore I can't blame you. Therefore you can't be the victim. You can't be guilty. You can't have shame over previous to this moment. Unfortunately, when we continue this conversation, you have to understand responsibility because it's the only way you're gonna get power back because we've been giving up our power in the context that we are victims of the world. And I go, we are creators of this world. If you learn it, then you can change the creation. I'm living in heaven. <laughs> it's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. This is a manifestation that I had to acquire the program to live there because my program earlier didn't give me that. I, I had great programming as a scientist. Yeah, uh, my scientific work was great. I love that. It was really great. Relationships? Nope. Got some real bad programming on that one. Uh, and, and so my life was a mixed bag of things. Mm -hmm. But now that I understand what are my programs, where am I struggling? That's where the program is. I can rewrite those programs. And if I rewrite those programs, and here's, listen to this, this is the coolest part in the world. Remember I said your conscious mind has the wishes and desires, the creativity, the aspirations. What do you want from your life? It's in the conscious mind. I said, what if you took those program beliefs and put them into the subconscious mind? Then guess what? Then 95% of the day, even if I'm not thinking about it, my subconscious mind is going to take me to those destinations. It's taking you to your destination right now, but most of those programs are not supporting of you. So most of the horror in your life is because the programs you were downloaded with take you away from heaven on earth. And you could reprogram the belief of heaven on earth. And I say, well, Eleanor, she's got a whole book about this. I think I would start there. That would be a really good place <laughs> to get back into taking your power back. It's, it's the wisdom. And I say, yeah, but you've been programmed that incorrect wisdom. The idea of a Darwinian world, that's wrong. The idea of a Newtonian world that separates energy, spirit from matter, body, it's like, that's totally wrong. They're all the same. They're all part of the same thing. Uh, the idea that genes control your life, totally false, 100% false. I go, what do you mean? You've heard, oh, the gene turns on and the gene turns off and the genes control the character. And I go, genes are blueprints. I go, that's exactly what they are. Why? What? They make the building blocks of the body called proteins. Proteins are like a Lego set. <laughs> 100,000 different proteins with different pieces I can assemble and make a human. And I go, so why is it relevant? I say, the gene is a blueprint to make the protein. So? I said, go into an architect's office and she's working on a blueprint. And you ask her, is your blueprint on or off? And she would look at me, what are you, crazy? It's a blueprint, there's no on and off. I go, yes, exactly. Genes are blueprints. The conscious, subconscious mind are the architects that read the blueprints and can modify the blueprints to fit the picture. You could come with totally healthy cells and end up with cancer. Why? Cancer isn't genetic. It's a lifestyle belief system. It's a change your lifestyle, change your belief, and cancers can disappear. That's how it's a reflection. Cancer is not a problem. People don't know that. They think, I've got the problem, it's cancer. I say, cancer is a symptom. It's that you're not living in harmony with your life and your cells are rebelling more or less, saying, this is garbage. My community of 50 trillion cells is not in harmony. And now it's a struggle inside, and that's called disease. And the point about it is, you are more powerful than that, except if your program doesn't give you that power, then you can't exercise it. And therefore, it's time to reprogram our lives because it's the program that we're manifesting. Is your life heaven on earth? Not necessarily. 
Then I say, why not? Is the earth against you? I say, no, your own program is canceling that. I go, and if you change the program, voila, heaven on earth. <laughs> I've been living heaven on earth for 25 years and I, or 26 years with my partner, Margaret. I go, why is it relevant? Because how did the struggle life that we have day to day, day to day, everybody's struggling out there. All of a sudden, one day you meet somebody and you fall in love. I go, what's the, what happened? Well, every day it was blah, 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 blah. Why? We're playing program subconscious 95% of the day, not supporting us, blah, 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 blah. I meet somebody on this day, 24 hours later, oh, life is so beautiful. It's a honeymoon. Everything is love and wonderful. What? You had blah, 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 all those years. And then in 24 hours, you got heaven on earth. What, do, what happened? <laughs> Science has recognized that the movie The Matrix is not science fiction. The movie The Matrix is a documentary, meaning what? We've all been programmed. And then I say, so what about the, the, the pills? There's a blue pill and a red pill. It makes a big difference. I say, what is it? I say, the blue pill, you take it, you go back into the program, and life is just the way it was yesterday and the day before. But I say, if you take the red pill, you get out of the program. How do I get out of the program? Ready? Mm -hmm. How come I'm playing the program? Because I spend 95% of the day thinking, which then allows the program to run automatically subconscious. But if I stop thinking, then I'm in control of my life with my conscious mind, wishes and desires. Science is recognized when people fall in love. And listen, that, that love doesn't have to be with another person. You could love a pet. You could love a job. Chef, I love the cooking. A gardener, I love to put my hands in the dirt. I go, when you're doing those things that you love, you stay present, be in the term is stay mindful meaning you stop thinking, you're so engaged with what you're doing, the conscious mind is staying in the front, it's not thinking. I say, oh, well, you only used to use that conscious mind 5% of the day. What if you used it 90, 95% of the day ago? Oh, you have a completely different life. I go, that's what the honeymoon was. The honeymoon was let go of the program and live on wishes and desires and when two people come together and they're operating from conscious minds only, both of them are creating with what? Wishes and desires. And I go, what does that represent? Honeymoon, heaven on earth. I said, but the honeymoons don't last, why not? <gasps> because when you start thinking that evil program in the subconscious starts to show up, now I'm living only 5% from my wishes and desires, heaven on earth, and I'm living 95% from the programs. I go, but those programs are self-sabotaging. They're, you know, <laughs> dysfunctional. So uh, I meet Margaret. Hey, I fall in love. Guess what? Conscious mind. I'm creating heaven on earth. This is so great. It's called honeymoon, blah, 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 blah. And then one day I start thinking about, oh, I got to fix the car. I got chores to do. I have some responsibilities. I start thinking. Margaret comes in. We were living conscious to conscious. Guess what? I am thinking. So now my life is not coming from conscious mind, it's coming from subconscious. She asked me a simple question and I turn around and play subconscious program my father and go, blah, blah, blah. And she looks at me and goes, who are you? Where did that come from? <laughs> and the fact is what? I didn't see it. It was a subconscious program played automatically while my mind was busy thinking. And all of a sudden she says, ooh, that's a side of Bruce I never saw before. I go, you never saw the programs up till now, why? Because I wasn't thinking, I was staying present. But now that I'm thinking, more of my life is now coming from the programs in my subconscious than from the programs in my conscious. The result is I start living my father's experience. Margaret looks at me, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> she didn't sign up for all that negative stuff. It's those negative things when they show up where couples have a problem because then one couple blames the other person. Well, what kind of behavior is that? That's really bad behavior. And then the person that expressed that behavior didn't even know they were doing it. Why? Because they were thinking and the automatic program kicked in. They're the ones that didn't see it. Now they're being blamed and they're going, what are you blaming me for? I didn't do all that stuff. I go, <laughs> You did, but you didn't see it. <laughs> Your partner sees it, okay? 
I say, so what's the result? The more thinking we're doing, the more the bad programming shows up. And if two people in the relationship don't recognize that is a program, they just think that is the person, then those bad programs lead to arguments and the arguments lead to a breakdown of the community. And 50% of those relationships end up in divorce. I go, where's the problem? The problem is this. They fell in love with the conscious creative wishes person, that conscious mind, but they broke up over the, oh, I was gonna say a bad word, bad, uh, the bad programs in the subconscious mind. Uh, and if they don't recognize they're two separate things, they just group them and that's the person. That's a bad behavior, Bruce. It's like, I didn't see it. I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> but the idea is that is not what keeps the relationship going. What will keep the relationship going is instead of an argument, when a negative behavior shows up, it's time for a discussion, not an argument, to say to your partner, well, maybe you didn't see how, uh, you know, what you just said or how you, you know, how you said it. Maybe you didn't see it because I saw it. It was this very, you know, and it's like, oh, now that's different than, that's a lousy way to behave, you stupid idiot. That, that game is over now, you know? But the other one is, maybe you didn't see how it worked or something like you didn't see it. I said, no, I didn't see it. Really did it. what I didn't know. I don't want to do that. I want to change that behavior. I go, ah, step one, opportunity to change the behavior. Because if you can take all the negative behaviors and reprogram into positive behaviors, guess what? You wouldn't even have to, you, you could think all day long and still end up heaven on earth. You, you could uh, use your conscious mind for anything but living and the subconscious mind, if it has your wishes and desires as programs, will manifest wishes and desires. That's the beautiful part. Your life is manifesting what you have right now and you don't even know you were doing it. It's automatic. I go, yeah, but the life we're experiencing right now is really an expression of some very negative programs. I go, yeah. What if they were all positive programs? I go, then I would have heaven on earth, honeymoon, every day of my life for as long as I lived on this planet. Is it true? All I can say is right now, for sure, it's over 25 years because that's how much time I've been on a honeymoon with Margaret. But the reality was I had to rewrite some programs that I downloaded from my family that were totally disruptive of this idea of heaven on earth. And if people know this, then all of a sudden it says, oh, I'm not powerless. I go, no, you are not. You're just powerless if you don't know, A, you're running a program. <laughs> B, where the heck did that program come from? And C, is that a program that supports me? I go, most no, probably not. And if you did know this, then there was an opportunity to move to the other side and do what Elena has, what is it called? Oh. <laughs> holistic wisdom this boy here gonna you read this book you're already getting information of what to do to take back that power i think heaven on earth is a hell of a better way of living than the way i live with my parents programming mm -hmm. and it's a completely different life and that's what i said in the beginning when i started to recognize this science i said oh my god you can create the most perfect life and that's what i wanted to tell people but that was conscious awareness. It never became subconscious programming. So while I could talk about it in the 5% of the time I'm being conscious, 95% of my life was not coming from that awareness. It was coming from the programs. And not until I changed the programs was I able now to manifest heaven on earth as a daily event in this life. And I highly recommend it because it's the best way to be living here, to wake up and joy and spend all day in joy. And it doesn't mean everything works out. It doesn't mean like, oh my God, it didn't work out. No, I'm so sad. I go, no, if it didn't work out, that's okay. Another way it'll work out. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be this. I can change things. And the idea is sometimes when things don't work out, it's not because you can't get what you want, but the universe is saying, the way you're trying to do it is probably not the best way to get there. So it's not going to work out. There's another way to get there. And that's when you start to realize there's another road you can take instead of being bullheaded and saying, it's got to be this way. I've done that in my life, ended up with what I thought was, now I got what I want. And then look, I said, this is not what I want. This is what, I didn't intend that. I said, ah, <laughs> You thought that was the right way. You pushed the universe. You got there and it turned out it wasn't the right way because the universe was telling you all along the resistance is because it's not the right way, Bruce. 
don't do it this way. You're doing it. I tell you not to do it. You're still doing it. Well, you're going to get it, Bruce. And I did. And it was like, uh-oh, is that what I wanted? Change the behavior. Go on a new path. Uh, what is uh, energy psychology? And uh, like, how does it work? Energy psychology yeah. is the equivalent of something called super learning, okay? Mm -hmm. And I say, what's super learning? I say, maybe you've seen somebody read a book like this. They take their finger and they go just down the page, read the page, mm -hmm. turn the page, move my finger down, just read the page. That fast. That's an example of super learning. They, in that state, my subconscious could read every word on that page as fast as I move the finger down. I go, oh, okay, that's a, a super learning capability. I say, what if you could use that super learning capability to rewrite a program? I say, oh, well then, instead of taking days or weeks to other ways of changing the program, uh, uh, energy psychology can help you change a program in minutes, walk away 10, 15 minutes later, but it engages a super learning that then is used to open the mind to a rapid download of a new behavior. The other way to get new behavior is to reprogram the subconscious doing what? And I go, well, uh, how'd you get uh, the program in the first seven years? Your brain was in theta, which is hypnosis. So I say, where's theta? I say, oh, remember at the end of the day, the moment you close your conscious mind, you fall asleep, the brain is in theta. I go, ah, wearing earphones, playing a program that you want to be true in your life, a program of love, health, business, whatever, good program. You just repeat that every night. I go, why is it? Why does it work? I said, your conscious mind went to sleep. You're not even working. So that's the cool part of this job. Just put the earphones on. Go to sleep. The subconscious mind stays awake longer, and as a result, here's what's on the program. And by repeating that program, mm -hmm. the subconscious mind will download it without you even have. You're asleep, <laughs> and you wake up one day, and guess what? The program is functioning, and you don't. I didn't have to do anything, just automatic. I go, that was great. That's called self-hypnosis. The second way of putting a program in naturally is after age seven, you're not using theta anymore, but you still learn things, how to drive a car, play an instrument or something. I say, how'd you learn then? And the answer was, oh, practice. I repeated the behavior over and over and over again. That creates a habit. Well, that's what the subconscious mind has habits. You want a different life, then practice a different life. You know, uh, the new agey thing, it sounds silly, but it's actually true. Uh, the new age thing is fake it till you make it. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? Because, well, let's say I'm a miserable person and every day I just say to myself all day long, in the spite of all the misery, I keep saying, I am happy, I am happy. You, you don't feel happy, that's not what the point was. The point is repetition of the term, I am happy because there's a point by repetition, habituation, that the idea of I am happy becomes a program. And then one day you wake up, you never have to say I'm happy, why? The program's already kicked in, you were happy the moment you woke up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually we gave, talk about this. Yeah. We gave uh, um, people a little homework after we reveal we their frequencies, you know, when, uh, when we do the vibrational frequency analysis. In, and we tell them to create affirmations, which yeah. is the opposite of the emotions that we, uh, we were able to capture from their program, right? That is, that is contributing to the resistance that they are experiencing in their life. So, right. and paying attention that these affirmations are eventually with enough practice, uh, it will become natural to them. Right. You know, we tell them 66 days, 67 days. And that's how they can obliterate the, the old programming. Yeah. Well, it's important to recognize uh, in the brain, there are no pictures of what's going on. In the brain, there's no physical expression. It's an energy. The brain is energy. That's why I read it by putting wires on your head called EEG, electroencephalograph. I'm reading your brain function. It's all energy. The nervous system's job is to take the reality from eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch, all the receptors and translate them into vibration. The brain does not see pictures. It reads vibrations. It, uh, uh, taste is a vibration. Touch is a vibration. I go, why is it relevant? Well, we keep trying to program this thing with all the physical realities, the visual, the sound, the taste, the smell, all these things. I go, yeah, that's one way of doing it, but guess what? You can bypass all that by just putting the vibration in. The brain reads the vibration. 
it doesn't see the picture. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is then I could put information in two ways. I could use my receptors, eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch, all those, to translate this into vibration, or I could put the vibration in straight and, and have it, no matter which way I get to the vibration, it's the vibration that is really where the change comes from. The brain does not see pictures or smell roses. It only has <laughs> vibrations yes. from those receptors. And so uh, changing vibration is changing consciousness. Yes. Mm -hmm. one, yes. One last question I have for you. And this is something I've been really thinking about a lot in the last uh, weeks, maybe even months. Uh, we've tested, and there's some belief systems that we're living in a simulation, right? That we're part of a simulation, the matrix. Yeah. What do you feel is the difference with this new meta metaverse idea of actually uploading your own consciousness or your thinking into, right? How is that different, would you say, in your belief system versus the idea that we're already in a simulated reality? I remember there was a show on HBO, and I think it was Wild West or something like that, and I liked it because there was a preview, and the guy said, well, I don't know if it was real or a dream. And the person he was talking to looks at me and says, it doesn't make any difference which one is it. You can't tell the difference of a dream from a reality. Are we in a dream world, you know, a, a manifestation of a dream world, or are we in a reality? I said, you can't tell the difference. You can't tell. So it says, and I don't care which one it is. If my involvement involves that I can change the picture by changing my consciousness, whether it's a real world or a dream world, I'm going to change my consciousness. Why? I want to change the damn picture. And that's what the game is. Uh, and if you understand that, then you recognize we're not victims, which we have been programmed to be, to give our powers to other people, because who are we? And I go, you're a creator. That's who you are. I go, but if you've been programmed not to create, then guess what? You will not do any creating. You know, Henry Ford, I love it. It's the shortest, most powerful sentence is, if you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. Mm -hmm. And what's the point? It's like, well, your thought is going to manifest it, whether it's the right thought or the wrong thought. The wrong thought manifests the problems in our world, and the right thought manifests heaven on earth. It's your choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's all about vibration, right? Both it's thoughts all vibration. and frequencies. Mm -hmm. This is what quantum physics tried to tell us, that this is not a real physical expression. This is an energy field. Mm -hmm. Energy is in terms of vibration. That's what energy is recognized as. And so there are vibrations of energy that are powerful that can affect you like uh, UV light can cause a sunburn, okay? Electrical wire can burn a hole in your hand. Cosmic X-rays can, can burn a hole. Th then everyone thinks, oh, energy is this powerful stuff. I said, but there are energies that don't have power, but they have information. Mm -hmm. I go, what do you mean? I say, well, there's a cell phone podcast going right through here right now. I say, it's not powerful enough to affect me on a physical level, but it's carrying information from one person to another person. Mm -hmm. So I go, oh, then energy is a physical characteristic called ionizing energy, which affects physical matter, or informational energy, which coordinates and organizes matter. And I go, we have to recognize that consciousness is the kind of energy that is not a power energy to burn a hole in you, but an energy of information that you can use to manifest a reality. Energy is everything. We are energy. Our thoughts are energy. The world is energy. Hard for most people to accept that. That's why quantum physics is always labeled the weird science because it doesn't conform to our conventional perception. Mm -hmm. And it says, when you understand this, you can change your perception. I said, then what? And I said, well, once you start to recognize that energy and consciousness are involved and all of a sudden, I don't go out and change the world. I go in and change the energy. The world changes after I change the energy in here. The world changes out here. Right. You know, this, this is the most important part. I'm old enough to remember the hippie days really quite clearly. I was old enough. <laughs> and I say, what, what was relevant? I said, there was a phrase that's so important, and I think we could use it today a lot. And the, answer, the phrase is simply this. Before you go out and change the world, take care of your own backyard. And what does that mean? It says, I might be like, let's go out there and change the world. I said, but I'm not living right. If I'm not living right, then how the hell am I going to change the world? First, I have to make me in the right place 
And when I'm in the right place, then I can contribute to the world in being a right place. Mm -hmm. And your book, oh, a <laughs> Thank you. First, one your last question. I know already said there was a question. Thank what you. is it's it? an opportunity? That book is an opportunity to take care of the backyard. Yes. So that if you take care of yourself, the world will change around you. You don't have to go out and physically change it. You change your consciousness, and the world around you will change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what is your daily life? What is the daily life of Bruce? I'm having a great life. <laughs> I wake up and joy. Okay. I have a job, which I love. And so it's not a job. A job usually is, oh, I got to go to the job. But my job is, oh, okay, here I am. What's my job? Oh, I'm talking with Alejandro and Elena today. Oh, that's a good job. I like that one. <laughs> then what? Then I um, celebrate with a wonderful meal. Very important. Food is not required. People don't understand that. That's another discussion topic. But the reality is the energy that really drives us is not coming from the food like we've been programmed. Oh, food is broken down, digested. Yeah, that, that helps make a physical body. But it's not really the source of our energy. Our energy comes from the atmosphere. We're like plants, except plants have chlorophyll. And we have something called melanin. Both of these are crystalline structures that translate environmental energy into biological energy. That, that's why breatharians, they hardly eat anything and they're as healthy as anybody else. It's like, yeah, we get most of the energy by just downloading it. The idea that food is our source of energy is a problem because it turns out the more we eat, the shorter our lifespan. Food is toxic in regard to when you digest food, which is the word digest means when you burn food, you give off waste products, just like in the car. You burn fuel, but out of that exhaust pipe is coming some toxic waste products, you know? Mm -hmm. Digestion, you burn the food, and out of that comes toxic waste products called free radicals, which are like charged bullets that when they hit a cell, they punch holes in the cell, which can effectively kill cells. So it turns out we should be living the minimum of 150 years. But the amount of food that we eat and the byproducts from that are self-destructive. And that the reality is we're killing ourselves by eating too much when food was generally to put some building blocks in there and for enjoyment. If it's enjoyable, that was, a, oh, God, that was the best tasting this or whatever. <laughs> That's great. If it's eat because I got to put some food in there because I got to get some energy out of there, I say, well, then you're wasting the food and your life in that process. Mm -hmm. So I work, which is fun. I eat, which is fun. I watch movies, which is fun. I don't watch TV. TV, bad. We don't have television either. Most people will walk in and say, where is your television? We're like, we don't have television. <laughs> well, I have a TV, but it doesn't play TV. It only plays movies that I select to put oh, on. There the you go. That's, a, that's entertainment for me, okay? That's great. And then I wake up and do it again. And in between, I'm in love all day with my partner, Margaret. And all day, happiness is just coming all through me all the time. And this was not the story of my life for over 45 years, mm. not at all. Uh, but I wouldn't change a second of it today. <laughs> today it's like, oh my God, I'm still here. Let's have fun. That's it's so fun. beautiful. And we'll end it at this, but I wanted to share one more thing with you. Yes. Because we revealed your frequency in our community, vibrational revelations. And you actually came up as one of the highest living frequency beings on this planet. Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine I know that. about that, but I can tell you, I'm one of the, from what I see personally and all around me, one of the more happy human beings on this planet because all those things that were stressors are not part of my life. Yes. And uh, I wake up, it, it's a whole different world. Wake up without a stressor. Yeah. What does that mean? It's like there's joy, there's total joy of being alive. And people don't recognize that. And I try to get people my conclusion so I can conclude with this one. You ready? Mm -hmm. A lot of people think you die. And if you live well, you can go to heaven someplace, you know, wherever. Wrong. <laughs> You're born into heaven. Yes. You were born to create 
what you desire because anybody's picture of heaven is a picture of creativity of what they would desire i say you don't have to die to do that you came here to create that you're not creating it bad programming mm -hmm. because when you are programming it right there is no difference between the presumed identity of a heaven and the reality of living on this planet and i live there every day and um I would miss it. <laughs> I, I agree with like, you. Yes, a hundred percent. I feel exactly the same way. Yeah. Well, this is why we can smile every day the way we do. And you are a wonderful couple because we have to be examples. Otherwise, it worked just like a beginning. I can tell you how to do it, but I'm not doing it. It's like nobody <laughs> wants to hear that story because it was really good. Then why aren't you doing it? Yes, but yes. I can see that you... Margaret and myself, we're examples of, no, we're living this idea. And as a result of living this idea, other people can experience it. Mm -hmm. And they can experience it, and then there's going to be motivation. They want, I always love it, the movie Harry, when Harry met Sally, yes. mm -hmm. and Sally fakes an orgasm in the restaurant. And a woman at another table calls the waiter over and says, I want what she's having. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you guys are expressing the love that you express, people are out there in their minds going, I, I want what they have. And the answer about that is you can have what they have. You just have to know the things that we talked about today to begin to manifest those things. Mm -hmm. yes. Beautifully said. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much, Bruce. Thank you for being you. Hopefully, and next time we can also meet Margaret. Yes. If she's ever open to it, we'd love to talk to both of you. <laughs> well, I look forward to that. And I wish you both the, the continued joy and happiness that you have now to go on and on and on and on. Thank you so much. Because that's why we were here. Yes. Enjoy your life. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being you. So much you. much you love you. and much happy love. holidays. Happy New Year to you. Thank you. And to all of us on this whole oh, webby yes. thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Bye. <laughs>